roundtable discussion on how we're going to try to do this. But I selected um, eight people here to discuss sort of the topic and then open it up to, after a period of time, open it up to a more conversation um, about the issue. The issue is about diversity and inclusion uh, in the industry on a level that's actually sustainable and equitable. Um, so I want to introduce the lead of this, Sean Charles. He's actually with uh, AMC with All Black Network. Uh, he's been, they've been working with us actually for months now since in the Latino as the, uh, for, as the AMC, um, the AMC Network, I guess, you yeah. know, um, to do sort of a Cine Latino, our international. They've been dedicated to actually opening up this business. They have several films on our festivals they're actually in distribution with now um, on their networks. And so I'm going to turn it over to him. But just give us all the talent of the round of applause. Thank you for the incredible introduction, Craig. Uh, and thank you all for coming here today. Um, I'd like to introduce my incredible panelists here, starting with Ganka Rose. I know. <laughs> I'll wait. If you'd like to introduce yourself first, then I'll come. Hey, I'm Bianca Rhodes, and I'm the St. Paul Neighborhood Network. Artists. I'm Sylvia Strobel. I'm with Twin Cities PBS, and I'm the president and CEO. My name is Joa Lee Grande. I'm currently an independent documentary filmmaker, but I used to be at SPN with Bianca. I'm Melody Bayham. I'm the executive director of Minnesota Film and TV, which is our state's film office. I'm DA Bullock. I'm a media artist and filmmaker here in the Twin Cities, originally from Chicago. Good morning, um, my name is Jesse Shortball, uh, with director of uh, Lakota Nation versus United States. I belong to the Northern Arapaho and Kickapoo Nations. Um, I reside here in Minnesota, originally from Northern Arapaho and Kickapoo Nations, Oklahoma, Wyoming and I'm a writer, director, producer, interdisciplinary artist. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I'd like to start with a question, uh, generally for all of you. Um, Jua, on your site, you have a quote that says, I believe there's no such thing as an ultimate truth, but instead versions of the truth that are put out into the world by those with the tools and resources to do so. How have you found the tools or resources to tell your versions of the truth all here? Um, and what tools would you equip up and coming filmmakers or executives with their, with their own toolbox? Do I start? Okay. Oh man. Okay. Can I do the last part first? Can you repeat? Um, what tools would you equip? Oh man, um, <coughs> as much classes as possible, um, opportunities as possible to learn as much as they, they can or want to. Um, I guess call it fail up, um, continue to get as many clicks on your <laughs> cameras and uh, equipment as much as possible. Um, yeah to take those chances. Don't be afraid to take those chances. Um, and uh, seek out uh, organizations and, and people that are willing to, to help you in those processes. Um, so I, I guess, I hope I answered a little bit. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, y'all. <laughs> this is my first time at the festival. I was, um, I've been fortunate and blessed to be in public media my entire career, which is a long time. And um, when I think about tools, there are a couple things that come to mind. I was very fortunate to have a paid internship when I started. 
and that's really what gave me the entree into public media. And I think that is a critical entree point for a lot of folks to kind of gain some skills and understanding, but it has to be, not everyone can do it in an unpaid manner, and that's where you see a lot of internships fall short. Um, and something that I know some of you know about, we um, at TPT, one of the tools that we had when I worked there in the 90s was a program called Don't Believe the Hype. And Daniel's here. Bianca was part of it. Um, and it was really this incredible initiative that ran for a decade, um, bringing diverse high school students from the metro in on a multi-year track to really learn about the media industry and not just production. There was a lot of production that was done, but also other parts of the business like finance, <laughs> technology, engineering and to kind of provide a, a lot of exposure. And the students stayed for multiple years to get that kind of depth of experience that's really hard to come by. And I'm just, you know, really thrilled that DPT has, we've been able to relaunch Hype after nearly 20 year absence. Last year was a pilot year. This is our first official year. We have a great class of 15 students. And to me, this is just, you know, one tool that I think is a really important way to start developing the next generation of our industry. Yeah, I think for me, um, aside from access to the tools and the opportunities and the skills, I think community is extremely important. Um, I know that, like, especially for folks who come from marginalized uh, communities, we're often told that our stories aren't that important or our voices aren't important. And so to find the people who know that our stories are valuable, believe in our voices and our abilities to tell our own stories. I think that goes an extremely long way. And I, I know that when I was trying to start out in the industry, it was not uncommon for me to hear people say something along the lines of, oh, no one knows anything about Hmong people, so that's not a story anyone will want to hear or whatever. And uh, over time, it was finding the people who are like, no, that story is important and we want to support that. And, building that community I think goes an extremely long way because then it's a community of support, people who have oftentimes more wisdom and knowledge and experience in the field who can point you in the right direction and people who are connected connected to opportunities, so, yeah. Jobs, um, <laughs> jobs. Yeah, uh, a big part of uh, what our office is responsible for is attracting productions, attracting producers, filmmakers to come to Minnesota. And we are continuing to work uh, uh, to get larger and larger projects here which pay decent union wages. And, you know, as I say to people, if you're starting out and you've got to have a day job, um, wouldn't you rather be working as a PA on a TV series than um, slinging coffee somewhere? So, jobs. Yes. So ditto to everything everyone said, not to belabor any point. Um, I, can you re-ask the question? I'm sorry, I just want to make yeah. sure I'm, I'm answering. Absolutely. Um, so, how have you found all the tools and resources to tell your versions of the truth? And what tools would you equip up and coming filmmakers and executives with? So I've found the tools by hook or by crook, you know, whatever means necessary to get the tools. And the tools come in a, a lot of different forms and not being becoming sort of uh, stuck. Because I started in, in film. So, you know, I was grabbing short ends from <laughs> commercials that I was working on as a PA. But the technology changed quite a bit and drastically. And so having an openness and a, you know, just a intellectual curiosity about what, what tools are out there and what forms are out there and are, are developing. And then just you know, not being shy about utilizing what you have uh, in, your, in your midst. Um, I, I really admire a lot of young media creators because they're creating on TikTok and people like kind of, you know, um, poo-poo that and make sure, and, you know, they, they, they sort of look down on that, but that will be the inspiration for the next, like, wave of, of understanding of how we present uh, media stories. Because, um, you know, everything that was handed to us, the legacy of 
telling you that you know you have to tell a story in two hours. That legacy was handed to you by by an industry that wanted to show up a certain amount of films and fill up a, a, a film house in order to, to make money off of it. Uh, there's nothing intrinsic about that that says that is our natural understanding of how to tell a story or that it is in, in one form. Because the other thing I've, I've embraced is um, the, the, the transcendental nature of a story, right? If I do a film about a story that it lives online and social media, it lives in conversation with people that, that screen it with me, it lives in many different ways. So really bolstering that and, and bolstering your passion and love for, for what you're doing um, to go along with what Jewel was saying is like, that's, that's a community building thing that is, um, the other side of, of technology is we, we kind of get lost on that because we become one, one person bands when it comes to, to filmmaking. So we lose out on some of the community building. So I, I would say lean into the community building, lean into the, the how the forms are evolving. Uh, that's, that's how you acquire the tools when it's not like readily available to you. Yeah, well, one thing I'd say is um, for, for the toolkit, you know, um, I grew up in a border town in South Dakota <clears throat> that uh, bordered the uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the state of South Dakota. So truth was always uh, in my mind as when I was a young boy. The reason being because I qu quickly understood that some people didn't like each other and some people had different versions of that truth. And, and so I always wrestle with it. So th the best thing that I could say for a toolkit for anybody interested in storytelling, and maybe some of you already uh, utilize this tool a lot, but uh, <clears throat> uh, creative intuition. Uh, because I think that uh, whatever uh, forces get us to where we need to be to telling the story, uh, I think as long as you continue to nurture that as a muscle or uh, a tool, um, it's definitely going to get you to where you need to go. And I think that um, the idea of truth, uh, and like I said, it's really hard to find the, the true truth, but uh, you can get as close as you can. So as you know, I come from a long lines of talkers. So <laughs> those of you who know my dad, Ernie Whiteman, he was one of the best talkers. So we're storytellers. I mean, as native indigenous people, we're storytellers. So I will slightly tell you a story. Pablo is just smiling back there. He knows our visits are like two hour long. So if y'all want a meeting with me, we got to block off two hours. That's how it goes. Um, well, one of the things for me is really remembering my ancestors. As, as who I am, somebody who belongs to a tribal nation, um, we have to remember those who came before us. Um, where we're at right now and who follows us. That's the most important thing is like taking that wisdom and knowledge from our elders, from our ancestors, but also for the people who founded this community here, this film community here in the Twin Cities. There's a lot of elders that are here for many different communities and backgrounds who are here that are a resource for you. I can look at so many in this room right now and I have so much respect for each and every one of you. Um, so utilize your elders, whoever they are. Second, um, where are you at right now in your life? Where are you at with your practice? You know, for me, it was utilizing my practice as a healing tool. Because I know for a lot of you young people, you've been through a lot, you know, specifically 2020 and you're still expected to go. You still have to keep going, right? And you had the most weight on your shoulders as the society is concerned. So just know, you know, that experience is gonna strengthen you, but also tell that story. Because my generation has no clue what you're going through. You have no idea. That's what media's for, you know, that's what uh, filmmaking is for, but also that is what tools like TikTok, whatever else platforms you have, you know, I'm just starting to learn about Web3. I'm just starting to learn, you know, about AR, VR, XR. And like, that is the next community build. That is the next shared wealth. Something that people see as scary is really something that young people are immersing, immers, immersing themselves in because 
there is no other way out because the industry is still about making money. It's still about you compromising who you are. That's still there. I refuse to do that. But what I, what I will do and what I will commit is to making a place for younger filmmakers and younger media makers and make sure that that's a safe space for them. And then I bring in my cultural practices to share so that you have a space that when you're gonna teach younger people or you're gonna create your community, you have those tools. So find people that you resonate with on that level that you feel safe, safe. That's the main things that you feel safe with. Because if you're compromising your integrity to move forward, you're gonna lose yourself. And then you're gonna look and you're gonna be like, oh, how did that happen? How did that happen? And it's like, well, you know, people promised us things and they didn't fall through. So I've been really fortunate to have my father help guide me through that process. And now that we've passed that baton, now that's my responsibility for younger artists, media makers, interdisciplinary artists, you know, and also do anything that you want. You know what I mean? Like if you're an artist, paint. You know, if you're a sculptor, sculpt. If you're a filmmaker, do that. If you're a musician, you know, learn as much as you can. And also like those of us that are, are producing, like we work with young people. You know, I make sure that I pay younger people. I make sure that they're paid what they're worth and there's a budget for them. You know, I don't take on interns for free. I don't do that. For me, that's unethical. So, the, the end. <laughs> That you all said some incredible things, um, and I kind of want to, and I think one built off the other, and strictly the point that you made, Sylvia, even that you brought up with Don't Believe the Hype and that the resurgence of that program. I'm so curious how you sort of seen that evolve from when it first originated to the students you're working with now, and sort of how you're finding you know, a new voice with this up and coming class of filmmakers? Well, I don't want to take a lot of credit for this because Robin Hickman Winfield just walked in the door. And so <laughs> she was, you know, she was one of the founders of Hype back in the 1990s and has rejoined us to lead the Hype resurgence right now. Um, I, a lot has changed in the 30 years since this, you know, I mean, we used to use big old cameras and had to be in a studio and, and now young people you know, can do everything on, on their iPhone. Um, but I think you know, one of the interesting themes and is that we've heard is not just about media creation, but there is an, there's an interest in, in telling the individual stories. There's also an interest in, I'll call it, for lack of a better word, media literacy. How is, how, how, how is media impacting young people? And how do you become informed to kind of read through all the noise and get your own story out. And I think that's really different from 30 years ago. That, you know, I mean, we all face it, but I think for young people in particular, just there's so much that's being thrown at them. And um, I think hype gives these young folks an opportunity to tell their story and, and to really, you know, push through and become really informed and educated and, and um, you know, advocates for what I'll just call media reform and media understanding. Did I do okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, to that, to that exact point, actually, Bianca, at the very, very young age of 14, was a part of the original program. So I'm so curious. Yeah, one, one. Right. So I'm so curious how that experience was for you personally, and sort of now how it affects what you do in terms of film and television. Um, it affects everything that I do. Um, my mentors, both Robin and Dan, gave me the lift as we climb approach. So everything that we did, it wasn't just media. Um, you were learning, you were learning media, but you also knew in the back of your mind, like, okay, there's a whole new set of young people that are coming and we're gonna be their teachers. So we need to know what we're doing. <laughs> And, um, and so that was very important. And what I took from that in my current work is I always want to bring on young people onto a set um, for them to experience it. I want, um, I make sure that my crew 
are people who even like kids and are okay with kids because they're going to be on the set. Okay? Um, <laughs> and uh, feel comfortable uh, showing them stuff. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's very intentional work, um, at least for me, uh, bringing in young people because that is what changed my life. Um, at the age of 14, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and I committed my life to it. I did not, I was telling, I was telling Sean, I was like, I didn't take any job. I didn't do no McDonald's, no, none of that. I did Lady Foot Locker because I was playing basketball. But other than that, I didn't take any other kinds of jobs. I was trying to find as much media opportunities as I possibly could because that's what I wanted to do in my life. So it drastically in impacted me. And I can never thank TPT enough for that. I felt that. I felt that. Um, that's that's incredible. Um, and you know, it, it actually brings up another interesting point of when you're all sort of looking at a project or looking to specifically tell these different stories. How do you keep the momentum right when certain perspectives are excluded? Certain stories are just overlooked. Um, what sort of helps you keep things going? Feel free to whoever that I'd love to hear from. DA, DA yeah, yeah, bully, <laughs> bully creative shop. You know, I, I'd love to know since you have your own. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, fine. But, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, so I developed a whole practice about around being a media artist, and and what I mean by that is. Um, so that I, I wasn't defined by an industry, I was defining why, like what is my, my reason for existing as a filmmaker, right? And it all goes back to wanting to tell stories from people like me, who grew up like me, who were in circumstances like me, who I felt weren't getting uh, the proper amplification of, of what they had to say. And what they had to say was profound and beautiful and life-changing and brilliant, yet it wasn't cracking through the, the surface of, and especially around, so my practice is around telling stories that affect public policy, right? Because uh, throughout all of our politics, throughout how we govern um, our states and cities and entire country, there's a story behind how we got there. There's a story behind how we got to a healthcare system that is not really about health, that's more about like people coming back from the war and trying to figure out how to refill the job roles. So giving this thing as a as little incentive, not designed from the start to to deliver quality healthcare. So if people know that story, they know, well, why are we holding on, on to something that wasn't designed as the best practice from the start, right? So to me, that's the fascinating part about um, storytelling from a public policy lens or media art making from a public policy lens is that you're always, you know, involved in, in, um, in relationship with people in the community that have like these extraordinary experiences and stories that are well informative about how we all live, right? Like, um, lately, a lot of the storytelling I've been doing is around police and police accountability and police within communities. And some of the most extraordinary solutions that I've heard and I've tried to amplify have come from grandmothers and aunties and people who raise kids and people who have faced uh, public safety in their face and they didn't have a gun, they didn't have a badge. Their authority came from love and respect and a lot of other things built in communities. So, um, those stories to me are the most prevalent and you can tell those from a lot of different ways, you know, from a lot of different media. And, um, so that's what, where the media art comes into play. Cause it, it doesn't limit me to just, oh, I have to make a film about that. It's, it's expansive. You know, the last, the last, you know, sort of iteration of that was projecting images of a, a wonderful healing artist named Deja, Deja Joelle, who's a dancer and healing artist, projecting images of her movement on 
burnt out buildings throughout the city that you know were as a were a result of some of this this police activity so there, there's like myriad ways you can engage media art or storytelling and it, it doesn't have to be limited by sort of what the industry tells you is the practice so that that's that's been my approach and, and that's been sustaining and fulfilling and otherwise i would have been highly frustrated like you know like not motivated it would have been more like here's another roadblock here's another roadblock here's another roadblock here's another you know way that i'm not allowed to exist as me in in this industry um so that's that's my personal practice but i, I believe that we all have that within our capacity because you know ultimately we we're all in this this sort of social setting and that's that's why we tell stories you know like going back way to the beginning of, of mankind is like, that's, that's why it developed as a, as an art form, as a, as a practice. Um, so. No, that's, that's incredible. And, and I think even to your point, Melody recently, we were just talking briefly about this, is working on another, to me, significant, really big opportunity here for Minneapolis. Um, if you want to talk more, a little bit more about it, just what you're dealing with with the $25 million, you get the commission. And... Uh, sure, happy to. Um, <clears throat> so unlike all of these other really brilliant artists on the panel, <clears throat> I'm not a storyteller. I don't, I'm not coming to this from the perspective of an artist. To me, this is uh, an industry about money and jobs and it is driven by incentives. Um, and uh, on the projects that we want to bring to Minnesota, the projects that are gonna spend the money and hire the people, um, they make their decisions based on where their budget's gonna go the farthest and how the, incent the state incentives work into that. So uh, we were able to pass our first tax credit uh, two years ago. Um, which is a huge step forward, but it was it is the smallest tax credit program in the country. We are in the middle of the legislative session right now, um, and we are in the House tax bill for a $25 million per year expansion, and that is going to be a game changer for our industry. So... We are going to see on Tuesday what the Senate is proposing. Hopefully they will propose the same thing, and then we will just slide through to the end of session and start uh, start bringing some jobs here. But, I mean, that is, I tend to think that bringing, the, the incentives are not designed for, you know, very, very small projects, under a million dollar projects, but... I think having, bringing those larger projects to the state gives opportunities that we just don't have here. Um, and I could go on about policy issues, but I won't right now. No, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I think even as you guys, even as you're, you're sort of talking about the different ways you're including different perspectives, whether through storytelling, through opportunities, jobs here, I'm curious in what ways are you intentionally or just sort of even stumbling upon different opportunities and entry points specifically to include, you know, BIPOC, whether it's from a PA's point of view, right? From a storytellers or producer, writers, um, what sort of initiatives or practices are you guys putting into place where you are? Feel free to, I'll start with you, Chua. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, well, for me, I think because some of the projects I've been doing recently have been national projects, and a lot of times when I'm talking to the funders or people who are bringing me on, they're talking about like, oh, fly someone in from the state, or fly, and I'm like, no, I want to I wanna invest in local talent because we have so many talented individuals who just don't get the opportunities here, oftentimes marginalized storytellers and so many of the talented folks that I've come to know have felt the need to leave Minnesota to go to New York or LA in order to gain the skills or get the opportunities. And my question is always like, how do we keep that talent here and continue to develop them? So in my practice, a lot of what I try to do is 
when I have a project, I very much try to get local talent, local crew who I know are extremely talented, who maybe just need the opportunities to get their name on, like in some credits to get more opportunities. And so I very much try to hire primarily BIPOC, primarily from communities that aren't getting those opportunities. Um, and oftentimes when there are folks coming in from outside of Minnesota, I'm always shocked when um, people come here and they're like, oh wait, there are people who know how to do this? And I'm like, yeah, there are many of us. And then a lot of them don't even know any BIPOC folks here, like none. Like um, I was brought onto a project last year that was um, executive produced by Stanley Nelson, who um, his documentary Attica was nominated for an Oscar, I think last year or the year before. and. Uh, their team came in, the director was a black woman from Florida and their team came in and I was the only BIPOC person they hired locally because they had no idea who else was here. And the only reason my name came on their radar was because they had reached out to people in their network nationally and my name came up. And so a lot of what I try to do is push as many names as I can out there so that if there are opportunities, whether it's here or elsewhere and they have the funds to fly people um, then we can actually get people opportunities to continue to like improve their skills and their craft, but then also show how talented they are. And it, it's always really surprising because a lot of people who come from outside of Minnesota who come here will say, oh, wow, Minnesota crew is some of the best crew I've ever worked with. Like everyone's so respectful, hardworking, determined. And I'm like, yeah, come back, hire more of us, like please. You know? <laughs> so um, I think a lot of it is just trying to put people's names out there to get those opportunities. That, I, I totally agree with you on so many levels. Um, and it's interesting because sort of as you talk about finding these different opportunities for different diverse people, sort of reminded me of something you said, Missy, and particularly because you're an interdisciplinary artist. So in all the different mediums you work with in, <laughs> um, how do you specifically, when you're looking at a film, when you're looking at any sort of art, really cultivate a space? And this can open, this is also, I'm curious to see how you all think about it. Cultivate a space that is safe, that is diverse, that is inclusive in what you do. I have a big answer for that, but I'll, I'll try to simplify it. Um, to me, there's like, there's really two roads that I'm on. Um, I'm a filmmaker. You know, my intention for getting into film was really like an early dream or vision that I had um, after I watched like The Outsiders. Like, I was like, this is a story that I can relate to. This is something that I feel resonates. I didn't know the industry at all. I just knew art because of my parents. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna do art because I don't know film. I wanna be in film somehow, but I'm not really sure. So I, I was acting here in the Twin Cities and um, at, from a very young age. And then also like once I moved into the space where I was ready to like be an artist, I went to uh, the Purpage Center of Arts Education. Um, I'm gonna really give thanks to uh, the Native Arts Circle and really gave thanks to the people that came before me because they brought Native directors here early on in the 1980s. Like I, get, I got to meet Chris Eyre when he was like in his early 20s, when he was just starting out, Randy Redroad when he was just starting out. And so I was really fortunate to have that mentorship moving forward. But for me, because of my cultural values, you know, like Native film is way different than the industry um, because we, we are really forced to look at like, our space and place, not only in our community, in the world, um, but also like, how is this story going to impact every everything and everywhere else? Like, how is this gonna help change, you know, one, the prophecies? Mm -hmm. So we are very much driven on our prophecies. So how do we balance that in this Western world? How do we make that balance between who we are as Native people, as traditional people, as ceremonial people, and also people like myself who was raised here in the Twin Cities, right? And so that's really like the journey of self, you know, and being patient for, for that, that space and place, but knowing that that's part of the process of understanding yourself in an entire world where there's, there's everyone, there's everybody from many different cultures, many different backgrounds, many different um, lenses of the world. And then where do we find that commonality? So for me as an interdisciplinary artist, I have that opportunity to create um, events like expanded cinema, 
which is um, film screenings. Like that's really the the base is film screenings, um, music performance, um, AR VR three sixty. Uh, we've had live painting. We actually had one this summer over at Owamini. And so it was uh, supported by um, Sean Sherman, by the restaurant, and also, you know, Minneapolis, City of Minneapolis, uh, the park board. But again, it takes like a lot of navigation and understanding like this is something that we have to do right now. Like we have to unify regardless of where we come from. And so my intention moving forward is not just say like, Oh, it's BIPOC. It's not necessarily BIPOC. It's more who are the people that understand their art forms as a healing process? Who, like, for example, if I'm going to work with a musician, do they understand healing frequencies? Can they bring can they bring that to the table? Do you understand mathematics in filmmaking? Do you know understand the importance of? <coughs> I'm not going to say numerology, but like the code, right? The code. If you understand the code then are you part of this, you know? And also like, can we all, like like Jesse said, can you be an intuitive creator with the rest of your, your collective? You know, and I think there's a lot of politics when it comes to film or it comes to interdisciplinary arts that we, got, we, get, we get caught up in versus like leading with our hearts, leading with our intuition and saying like, yeah, I vibe with you because, and let's work together, right? And that's really what it is, is like, can we bring this energy together and can we elevate one another as artists and build trust through that process and build family? And so intention is everything. So if my intention is I'm going to offer my medicine, my tobacco, whatever it is, my, you know, my offerings and ask for permission to do this in a way that's clear, transparent, with love, with heart, with healing, you know, then those right pieces come together. But I have to continuously add this to my process every single time. And if something happens in the collective, we have to still come together and figure out what happened and come together and find that solution together and then keep moving forward. Because without that, you know, we're also not building a, a greater understanding of ourselves as artists and filmmakers, but also like how do we function in the world now that everything is re in the rebuild state? Like we are rebuilding right now. So how do we bring that attention to that space? Yeah, I, I love that you touched on that um, because it's, to your point, an industry-wide conversation of, of um, sort of rebuilding and sort of revisiting and reestablishing, tearing some things down, building new things up, and having a lot of people be a part of that conversation that never were. Um, and to that point, what do you think is one thing every filmmaker, artist, uh, uh, financier, distributor, executive should know specifically about this work, right? Whether it's it's in, outside of like, it's really important for you to like, get an apprenticeship or it's really important for you to get these skills. The one thing that will help you continue to succeed. Yeah, yes. How to produce how to produce creatively, how to build networks, how to build relationships that are solid, you know, mm -hmm. and I see so many people in this room that build like solid relationships, despite how you feel about people personally, you still got to like show up, mm -hmm. <laughs> you still got to show up and be a big girl or a big boy and put your big girl and big boy pants on and show up and shake hands and give hugs and high fives and dap each other up. That's it. Like there's a bigger picture to this all. So producing, but I'm going to go back to say producing, understand how that money flows or how resources flow and also look into like other ways, other forms of, you know, funding. Like I know like, mm, like cryptocurrency is something that I think a lot of people in LA are looking at right now and looking at funding like Baron, what's his name? The basketball player, Baron. Thank you. Yeah, like I got to see his compound. I was like, and I met him and I didn't even know what he was doing. But my friends are like, hey, come meet this guy. And this is what he's doing. So I'm, I learned a lot. And so I have a lot of hope in that, that new, the new way of currency. So yeah, the end. Do you want to you go first? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I, just to kind of build, I guess, off of what Missy was saying. Uh, one thing. Um, would be uh, 
and and uh, this gentleman was kind of alluding to it, you know, like having um, your own um, values and and re uh, looking at ethics. Because the reason I say that is because in Pine Ridge, you know, a lot of times um, it it almost seems like media had become like a mining industry, like uh, extraction, and and not uh, the community's uh, desires weren't never really forefront, and it was more about um, some of the bigger challenges that they faced and. Uh, what they had to deal with every day. So I, I would just say that um, any time that you can enhance your responsibility with the story in whatever capacity that may be, producing, writing, um, that'll always uh, help you out. I would like to add, um Definitely authentic relationships, um, putting your, like like my friend said, putting your, your big girl, big boy pants on and, um, and uh, also having candid conversations in those authentic relationships and um, speaking up uh, and when you see things that aren't working um, and, and being real about those things. So... Uh, and not being afraid, <laughs> not being afraid, being authentic to yourself. Um, so, yeah. Can I jump in and say I'm sorry, I meant non-binary pants. My apologies. <laughs> Just people pants. I'm sorry. Pants. <laughs> if I offend in anyone, I'm sorry. Add to that. Just uh, to, for what Bianca was saying, um, <coughs> authenticity, I think, coming from a producer, network, financier perspective. Oh my God, the the folks that have contacted our office with, you know, I have this native story or I have this, this Somali story, this Hmong story. It's like, okay, who on your creative team is telling this story, you know? It's like five white guys? Uh, no, that's really not... No. And so, you know, I feel like my, even though I'm not a creative, I can at least have that conversation at the front end before they come in and just create a shit show. <laughs> yeah. No. I, yeah. Um, and I'll just add that it, for me, it was very difficult when I was given the advice, you need a network, because for me, I'm like, oh, networking, you feel so extractive and like, but then a lot of it, I realized, is just relationship building. Like, you meet people who are really amazing and folks who you admire and you build relationships that are authentic. And um, and something that I think that a lot of us as Minnesotan filmmakers don't do enough of is building relationships with those outside of Minnesota because I think a lot of amazing knowledge can be gained and opportunities and um, opportunities for people to come here and do their work here as well. And um, I think that's important as well. I just want to add, um, like, make sure you um, define and realize your own value. And what I mean by that is, so we, we exist in an industry that will tell you, you your, your value is less than what it actually is. And that's time and time again, they're going to lowball you on your true and actual value. So you, you know that by what everybody's discussing. You know that by the relationships that you have, the people who are supporting you within the community, um, but even down to like um, things like analytics and impressions around the art that you make and how you're engaging with your audience. Um, knowing the value of having, um, you know, a hundred people who really, really are into your story versus 10,000 random computer generated non-people. Like understanding what that is and how to navigate that in some of these negotiations with, with industry people. I mean, that, that's an important part of it too. Um, Cause we, we've even seen um, like recently Georgia Fort 
uh, I'd like to bring Georgia forward because she's wonderful, wonderful storyteller, wonderful community member, but she had to like understand and know her value and then redefine her position in an industry that told her she was not valuable, even though she knew that was not the case because she knew it from community relationships. She knew who trusted her with all of the stories around the Minneapolis Police Department versus um, the, the mistrust and distrust that was amongst a lot of the other media sources. So I use Georgia as a, a shining example, and, and you all should too, is you have to understand your own value and you have to define it and you have to be very strong and stand on it because that's, that's true and, and real. The other stuff is kind of like the bullshit and, and like, you know, the playing around it of, of negotiating and trying to make you lowball yourself, which is um, unfortunate because it is an industry and it becomes a, a, a money game, a numbers game. So that, that would be my advice. No, I think that was great. Uh, I like to call it the politics, but I, I hear you. Know, I hear you. Um, um, but I'd like to open the floor up to any questions from the audience, if any have. Yes. Yes, please, in the back. Got it. So just to, just gonna repeat on the mic so they can catch it. Um, so your question is, what are we doing to make sure the project's working on? We're working on our in public domain for the future, correct? Please. I mean, I, I look to a lot of artists in the music industry because they figured it out a while ago, like that the studios and the the owners of their masters, masters being their. Um, their original, you know, makings uh, and creations, that wasn't lucrative for them. So they started giving away some of their creative product in order to have a, you know, one-to-one -one sort of communication and understanding with um, their audience. So I, th I think we have the technology now to circumvent a lot of the sort of ownership class of media and make things public domain from the very start. I mean. There's always a balance, but that's that's exists right now. Unfortunately, it's within the framework of a, a YouTube or a, you know Vimeo, which is not publicly owned. So, but but the idea is if you extrapolate that forward, then how are we getting together and building our own sort of crowdsourced, public sourced um, platform that holds some of that? archival and public domain stuff. And that, that's something I'm very much interested in. I don't have an answer, but I, I feel you on that question for sure. Yeah, that's that's the same too, is like uh, creating your own platform. And also, I mean, we do have to sign contracts. I mean, that's really what comes, you know, as independent producers, independent filmmakers, we do have to, I would say like get an attorney like really work with an attorney, look at the fine line, read. Um, and if you don't already have a positive relationship with the entity or organization that you're working with already and there's leniency in that contract, you know, that's what I'd say, get get an attorney. But, you know, it's really like, you know, making sure that you're, you're up on your contracts. So if you, let's say I pass away suddenly, right? I want to make sure that's not going to happen. I'm going to be here till like for a long time because, you know, but I'm just saying, um, you know, I want to make sure that I have it in writing, writing who has creative control of my, of my work when I, when I carry on. So, yes. As a recovering attorney, um, who's worked with many of you in this room, uh, you know, it's an, it's an interesting question. I think there have been, you know, I'd say over the last decade or so, some interesting avenues that have come about, like Creative Commons, which is a great place to share content. Um, you know, obviously there are sometimes contracts and rights issues that, that underlie that you just can't get around. But I think with 
with technology changing as fast as it is and AI, frankly, I think we're in for a fascinating ride when it comes to content and ownership. And, and you know, I think we can kind of set the stage for what that is because certainly the folks in Washington are not going to do it. Yes. Right there? Yes. <laughs> Not necessarily. I mean, it's a whole, I mean, you say web three, that's a whole new realm. It's a different realm. So if we compare it to like a meditative state, right? If we're going to say when we meditate, we go to a different state. So that's really what web three is. We're creating a whole new realm through this media, through, through AR, VR 360. And so we're immersing <coughs> ourselves in that media and it could be used with a v, with like QR code. You can put it wherever, you know, and somebody can scan it and look at it on your phone. If you have headsets, you can you can immerse yourself in the headset. Um, so it's really about individual use versus a community. So that's the part that's tricky. That is the part that's tricky because the question then is, how do we create community utilizing this new art art form or creative form or whatever you want to call it, technology? How do we do that? And so I think that we're figuring that out. That's the beautiful thing is that because we're artists, we get to say what goes. We get to say what goes. For example, if I'm creating an AR character for my experience, I get that's casting. Like I get to cast that character because I create it. I create that avatar. I say what color hair they have, what they look like. I can actually base it off of a real person you know, and then I get to create that environment that they're in, regardless of what it is. It could be 360 video, it could be a narrative form, it could be animation, it could just be a still room with different objects that people interact with. There's so many different ways that we create can create in this realm and in this way. But for me, I would like people to understand the experiences like in boarding schools. I would like people to understand my people's perspective where you know, I have control of that. You know, there there aren't very many Native, especially Native women producers out there that are producing like this. And so we're in the forefront. My team and I are in the forefront, you know, and they're able to understand, like, why is this important, not only to my people's story, but to everyone else here that can say, like, oh, yeah, boarding schools happen everywhere. Boarding schools happen in Ireland, in Scotland, in New Zealand. It happened to all of us. This form of genocide happened everywhere. But until we understand the perspective of the First Nations people here, we're not going to understand our own. And so for me, it's really important to have, um, have this reality be told in a way that's understandable and palatable to people, where it doesn't trigger shame or guilt. Because I, that's not the intention. The intention is to have an emotional response and an empathy that is created to this experience to say, okay, I'm taking this in and I'm understanding it. So how can I educate other people now that I know this knowledge? How can I be an advocate and an ally now that I understand this experience? That's really what it comes down to is being an ally, using your privilege to help other people when you know that you can. And I have to say like what you just said about the producing non-natives producing, that's a huge problem, huge problem. And I'm going to say this, there's people in like Sun, who worked for Sundance, Heather Ray, who was recently outed as being um, non-native. She claimed that she was Cherokee, and she was recently called out for being non-native. Now it's happening. The end. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
thing what bike do you have? Um, so somebody would have to ask you, you know, you're gonna be young and try to figure out if they're gonna go more educational or not. The cool thing is your generation can do both. You know, um, you got your computer at home, you know, you can still take classes, you can cross-reference, be like, are they telling me the truth or are they lying? Am I paying for a joke? So um, you could totally do both. And I would, I would definitely, yeah, I would say do both. Don't limit yourself because you're young. So do all the things. Do it all, <laughs> do all the things um, and have fun with it. Um, there's also uh, online schools that actually give you equipment, give you computers, give you all the things. So you have a lot of options. So don't limit yourself, do, do it all, honey. And I'll, I'll also add that um, as a young filmmaker, the advice I got is the same advice I give, which is advice I hated hearing, but I know it's true, <laughs> which is like the best way to grow as a filmmaker is just to do it. So a lot of times, if you, even if you go to college, that's oftentimes not where you learn how to make films. You learn by doing it, the trial and error and getting better and better, even if it's at first just making fun little films with your friends and then realizing, oh, that was terrible. I'm gonna do it better this time, this way. And you continue to grow that way. and. Um, there's YouTube University, which I think is where a lot of people, even super experienced filmmakers will be like, oh, I don't know how to do this one thing. They'll go on YouTube. And there's an answer, you know. Um, and then also here in the Twin Cities, we do have a lot of amazing programs supporting young aspiring media artists. So there's, um, there's SPNN with some free programs. Doc U is if you really want to learn like how to use a camera from like where's a record button to how do you frame to how do you do lighting um, to more advanced there's in progress who also does a lot of great work and then film north does it's paid but they also have some very talented folks teaching so there are other opportunities and people to learn from and a, a great way is to also you're not too young to start meeting folks because like after this, you should introduce yourselves and then, then your name is gonna be on our radar. Next time I need a PA, I know who I'm gonna call, right, so. I'm gonna say indigenous roots as well. Um, so there are people that are produce, young producers that I'm actually working with um, right now in a project who are uh, associated with indigenous roots. I just wanna say the one, one thing that, that I think is important for everyone and it's something that we talk to about legislators to legislators all the time about is that most of the jobs in this industry, you don't need a college degree. You know, it's great, I am all for college, um, but if it's not your thing, you don't have to have one for certainly the below the line jobs. If you, you know, get, get some PA gigs and kind of figure out what direction you wanna go, um, you may end up wanting to go to college or you may just, you know, I'm going to follow this track and end up in the union and, you know, live my life. So.
<laughs> Thank you so much for that. Did we have any other last questions for us? Um, my biggest thing is Gordon Parks, my biggest thing, and I always mention this in, in some way when I'm uh, interacting with hype and stuff is building a rapport. So building a rapport, and, and Dan, I've, I've seen it in action, um, building a relationship with your content, with your the, the person that you're interviewing and all of that, when you have that relationship, it, it won't happen as much in a way it's always gonna, you know, it's your art. So it's gonna have pieces of you, but because you have this beautiful relationship and understanding with your content and with the person that you're interviewing and the, the narrative and, and all that stuff, it, it just won't, it won't be there as, as much as you think it would be. Does that make any sense? So I think, you know, it, it goes a little bit above and beyond just grabbing the interview, you know, just grabbing, you know, the B-roll, you know, you got to think about the experience of it um, and what that means to that person. Um, so when you keep those kinds of things on the front of your brain, it won't, it won't happen as much. Um, yeah. What, what also like to add to that, um, at least from like even the network side to your point, um, a huge piece I would also say, and, and Jesse said it well, and so the DA touched on it a bit of just like your creative intuition, like following what feels right to you in the story. And the best thing about this industry is it's extremely collaborative. So it can take a different shape and form as you get to tell, you know, your own version of it. Um, and sort of remaining open to what that can be is sometimes the best way to, I think, create a project. Sorry. I was just gonna say I'm I'm a hundred percent biased. Like so <laughs> I'm I mean I'm not shy about it. I just own it and recognize it and I'm very transparent about it. But I'm also a hundred percent honest and, and truthful and have a trusting built relationship with the people that I'm, you know, um have a relationship with that I'm I'm trying to present their story. So and I and I say that because I think often we're told that to be, you know, sort of classic professionalized journalism, you have to be unbiased. And I think that's a myth because TPT is biased, Frontline is biased. All of these sort of institutional figures in documentary world are also biased. They just do, like, they're, they're more, they're less transparent about their bias, right? So I feel like if you're coming from a point of view and you as a filmmaker are bringing your, your full self to that, um, that's additive. That's going to actually um, give you, you, you a specific part of that story that may not have been told before. Um, instead of you trying to present all the sides and, and trying to create some false, um, you know, balance between two sides. You know, sometimes the truth has a bias. And I think you, you can honor that and own that and be transparent about that and not have to figure out how you diminish yourself and your own understanding of the world that you live in in order to deliver a quality professional documentary. I'm gonna say this, like jumping on uh, the whole entire, like uh, having bias or implicit bias, right? Um, I think for me, like when people find out that I'm a native filmmaker and I'm a woman, people are like, whoa, like they talk to me like I'm a unicorn or something, <laughs> you know, which is which is like, I'm like, yeah, like we actually like do stuff that like you <laughs> and we watch TV, too. We watch movies. Um, um, but it's but the thing, too, like that's really important um, 
for me that I've learned along the way is to like show up professionally, like to be as professional as possible. You know what I mean? It's not only like, am I representing my family, you know, my family, my people, my nation, you know, my tribal people, but I'm also representing myself, you know, as Missy Whiteman, as a human being, as a person, as a filmmaker, also taking understanding, you know, my relationships with my cat, my crew, you know what I mean? And the people I work around with, like to treat them res with respect, but also to also uh, teach that we respect one another in a way that is, yeah, it's family, but it's a professional family, if that makes sense. You know, where we have each other's back for the big vision um, and also have boundaries and, and boundaries for people that you work with, like have clear boundaries with people. You know what I mean? Like for me being a female, I really have to put up really tough boundaries with the men I work with and to say, great, you know, I know like we have this vibe with each other and this chemistry, but listen, like what's more important, dating or the project? And and like I was telling my, my sister here, Natalie, it's like 10 times out of 10, they say the project, which I'm really happy for. I mean, my ego is a little bruised, <laughs> but you know what I mean? I'm still like, that's important. And I'm gonna say this, I have worked with TPT. It's been a very interesting uh, navigation for me where I worked with the Native Governance Center um, and they hired me to, to produce four short 90 snapshot pieces, which were nominated for an Emmy. And that was the first time, right? That something like that, a short form, that short, short form had ever been nominated. And it was talking about tribal politics. And I was talking about the government taking stuff from Native people and treaties and talking about all these very complex issues. And TBT gave me that space and the trust. Like, of course it was trust building. We had to switch editors. I was like, please, can we switch this editor? Cause he don't get it. He's trying to manipulate the thing and the, about the thing and talking. And they're like, we'll switch it up. We got you, Missy. So that's the thing is like, but part of that is having your integrity and your self-worth as a filmmaker and as a producer and knowing that your worth, like, you add to to that, like they value you. So they're gonna be like, we got you. So if they don't value you, they don't got you. Um, I'll add, I think it's really important, especially because you're in documentary. I think most people go into documentary largely because they wanna make social impact, right? And when you're hoping to make social impact, you do so knowing you're going to upset some people who don't want things to change. And so you have to ask yourself very seriously, who am I okay with upsetting and who is it that I would not be able to live with myself if I upset, right? Um, and then something that I have re found really important in my process is I have been very intentional about who my team is and that they share very similar values and that they're also not afraid to challenge me because I wanna hear if I'm blind to my own biases that would in the long term hurt the community I'm doing a story about, I want someone to be able to point it out to me, right? And I, I've been working very backwards in many ways because I'm already doing, I've been doing feedback sessions even in the development stage during production because I'm bringing people from the community that I really care about and wanna make sure that I'm portraying in a way that is honest and respectful and accurate, you know, truthful, from our perspective, our community's perspective and pulling them in and just asking for feedback. Like, what is it that resonates? What is it that doesn't feel accurate? What are things that feels like it could <laughs> potentially cause harm? And having people that respect you enough to be honest, and especially if you're from Minnesota, there's so much Minnesota nice. And this is something that I've found really frustrating because I'm like, if I show something for feedback and all I hear is that was great. I'm like, that's not helpful. <laughs> that's not like, <laughs> yeah, so surrounding your, yeah, surrounding yourself with people who have respect and support for your work, but also are willing to be like, oh, but here are some things to think about, right? Who are willing to push you and challenge you a little bit. And I found that um, once I brought on an editor, I, I very valued that they'll push back a little bit. Like, no, I disagree because of this and we can have thorough conversations about why. And that really helps if you just surround yourself with the right people. I love that you said that. Uh, I wanted to add like two last things because I thought um, also um, just like trusting yourself, you know what I mean? And and not necessarily one thing that we, we like filmmakers, producers, even sometimes network folks just talk about is people creating things that they think we want versus what they want to create. 
and the other thing of asking themselves the question of like why this why now like that's one thing we always leave them like why did you create this why did you tell this story what was the driving force behind it and sometimes at the root of that answer is you know you can tell the influence came from exterior forces and not necessarily what was driving them in the project but um so just trusting yourself and sort of you know really leaning into that voice yes i just want to close this out okay. craig is going to tell you give me those okay go ahead yeah yeah no uh thank you again i just want to thank the panelists again another round of applause for having this amazing conversation So um, I hope this was helpful to you. This is uh, something that I wanted to try to do. I wanted to leave some time that some people will not talk in a group or raise their hand in a group. I do know that. So I actually have seated this room with some people that I really, truly respect of what they're doing. And they're actually engaged in the process of in in uh, integrating this business is uh, Dan Bergen, Leonard, sister, Robin Hickman, who I love. And Andrew Peterson with Film North. Um, so I want to give you guys some time to talk to people, and Carrie, sorry, Carrie, missed you, um, to talk um, amongst them and get to know them. This business is a business of network. And I mean, I don't happen to know all these people on this panel. I know all these people on this panel. They were selected. I know these people. Because this is the only way that we can actually sort of cut through the clutter and the, the, that we've been living with in this business. This is all our business. It is all our business. It does, nobody owns it. Nobody controls it. I have always had a dream, Robin knows this, probably 30 years ago almost, I put, had a project on Martin Luther King's birthday. It was a film for Bush Communication. I decided I had an all black crew in this town, everybody, you know, every sound, lights, cameras, everybody. And so when they walked in, makeup artists, they looked in and says, what's going on here? I said, this is production here. This is not new, this is not, and we have to build this back up in this town. We have to build this back up in this community. If we ever want to see that happen, we have to start building from the ground up, get to the top. Thank you. Thank you.